uh, what I would like to uh, uh, like to do, you know, like the 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 subject of the talk is uh, from Graham to Fisher, and uh, uh, last year, you know, twenty twenty is a year that most of us would like to forget, and uh, probably even half of twenty twenty one is appearing to be the same way. Uh, but it was it was actually uh, an unexpectedly uh, amazing year of growth. Uh, and learning for me, and uh, and uh, I think it was a period of renaissance. Uh, so I'd like to share uh, share some of that with you, and uh, and uh, talk about that. So uh, there's a there's a book coming out in uh, in six days, and uh, the book is called uh, uh, Richer, Wiser, Happier. Uh, and it's uh, written by uh, William Green, uh, who is a uh, former journalist with Time and uh, just an excellent journalist and writer. And uh, and I think I think he did an incredible job. It took him several years uh, to write the book, and I think uh, uh, you guys will uh, would love to read it. Uh, I got a galley copy of the book uh, uh, maybe close to about ten months ago, and. Uh, of course, there's a chapter one about some yo-yo, which you can skip. But uh, but chapter six, uh, to me, chapter six was uh, uh, the most uh, eye-opening chapter. And uh, and chapter six, in many ways, was uh, transformational uh, for me. So chapter six uh, was about uh, Nick Sleep and his partner, uh, Case Zakaria. Uh, and they they ran the Nomad Investment Partnership from uh, 2001 to uh, 2014, about uh, 13 uh, 13 years or so. And um, and I've I've actually known Nick for close to two decades. So so we've we've been friends for a while. But I I mean he lives in the UK and we don't uh, uh, we don't interact that much. And uh, what I had not kept up uh, with Nick was that he had been on this uh, value investing, learning and growth journey. And uh, he got to what uh, he considered the pinnacle. And I'd say uh, I would be mostly in agreement with that. And uh, so that chapter um, had a number of uh, eye-opening insights and it led, uh, led me to... Uh, hit the reset button uh, in many ways about how I thought about uh, about investing. So uh, for the lo- longest time, you know, uh, the simple math I used to use on investing was that if you bought a dollar for 50 cents or 40 cents, and you just patiently waited for that dollar to be recognized as being worth a dollar by market participants, uh, then you could earn a pretty handsome rate of return, even if that uh, even even if that pie did not grow. So basically, if it took if convergence from fifty cents to a dollar took three years, uh, then you know you would end up with a 26 percent annualized return. And if it took a couple of years, then it would be kind of mid thirties. And uh, all of that, of course, is very acceptable. But also, what we have is we have investing mistakes, so probably 40% of the time when we make investments, they don't go the way we want. So not everything uh, doubles like the way we expect. And uh, so some some businesses we'll actually end up losing money on, some will flatline, and some will deliver much lower returns and all of that. But, but when you mix it all up, the end result uh, is still very acceptable. Uh, and that's why value investing uh, investing works, and uh, and that uh, you know buying a dollar for fifty cents uh, was a bedrock for me, and uh, and you know it's the bedrock for Ben Graham, and it's the bedrock of what we've uh, what we've all learned and 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 uh, used. Um, Nick Nick posed some uh, interesting questions. Uh, so he said that if you, if you looked at a business like Walmart, uh, which went public about, uh, I think 51 years ago, and, uh, 
and uh, so in one of his last emails to me he said that um the only people who held walmart stock for that entire 51 year period was the walton family and uh, and there are as far as i know no public investors who have held the stock for 50 years or 40 years or even 30 years and if you didn't recognize walmart was an exceptional business in 1970 you could have recognized that by 1980 or you could even recognize that by 1990 by that time the company had several decades of history behind it uh but uh, but in spite of all of that data um uh public investors uh did not hold the business for uh an exceptionally long period of time and uh the the second uh, the second question that nick sleep asked was that if you were a portfolio manager say in the mid 80s or you know maybe the early 90s or some somewhere around there and you held walmart stock in your portfolio what exactly were the factors that led you to eliminate that position and he asked a kind of a i would say a mirror question to that which is that in, in the 80s early 90s if you held kmart stock uh what caused you to hold on to that to the to that stock and not sell it and uh and and then uh nick also pointed out to me and i think he does this in uh, in his uh, letters as well and by the way now he has made uh those letters public so i think if you if you go to god google and just enter nick sleep nomad letters i think they'll pull up and uh and those are a exceptional read i think that uh reading those letters and then uh you know in conjunction with william green's book i think is uh is an incredible uh, growth opportunity so so nick did us a a great uh, favor by by making those those letters uh, public and uh so then the uh the other thing that nick was saying to me in an email but he also says this in his letters is that uh walmart uh was a company that in the 70s you could have paid you know 150 times earnings uh for the business and from then till now earned a double digit annualized return with no taxes due for five decades and um, other than for the dividends and uh, so you could have paid what would have looked like a ridiculous price uh for the business and of course it did not it did not trade anywhere near 100 150 times trailing uh, earnings uh, so it was available at a a fraction of that and uh, and of course you know i would say the the opposing view would be that retail is really difficult and the landscape of retailers uh who are no longer with us i mean the graveyard uh for retailers is overflowing so it is the it is the exception as far as retail goes who actually makes it so i'm not particularly concerned about retail and uh those aspects of it what uh, what uh, uh what i was uh, trying to look at is that was there a different and maybe better way uh to approaching investing other than just this you know buy at 50 cents and a dollar and then uh, last year i also read another book and i think this book is exceptionally well written and it was written i think uh, close to 50 years ago about 49 years ago and it is uh, called uh, 100 to 1 in the stock market and uh, this is written by thomas phelps and uh, thomas phelps actually is a exceptional writer and a uh, exceptional journalist he used to be a writer for barons and uh, and such so he's a he's a, he's a very bright guy he's obviously he's passed away uh, but he did a he did he did a tremendous job with that book so even though that book is uh, you know 50 years old it's still 
uh, very relevant and uh, and the writing is still very fresh and there's uh, there's a bunch of interesting kind of uh, uh, areas in the book like he's he's got conversations uh, with Joe Kennedy who was the founding uh, commissioner of the SEC and the uh, father of uh, John F Kennedy so there's there's uh, some interesting uh, tidbits in there as well but uh, uh, Phelps Phelps basically pointed out that basically if you if you were a very patient investor and held on to these businesses for in some cases many decades uh, there were hundreds of them that would have delivered a hundred to one or better returns for you and uh, so the um, the framework shift I made uh, was not so much to look at look at hunting and finding fifty cent dollar bills, but to look and try to find businesses that could be a ten bagger or preferably a hundred bagger, and of course the hundred bagger might take a couple of decades, uh, but that's perfectly fine. And uh, you know, there's a there's a quote. Uh, there's a quote I'd like to share with you, uh, which is from the Upanishads. And uh, the Upanishads are these ancient uh, Indian uh, texts that were written uh, more than 2,000 years ago. And of course, they have a you know boatload of wisdom in them. But uh, for our purposes, and I'm not sure they had uh, the idea of making investors wealthy, uh, the writers of this quote, but I think it works for us. So the quote translated is, as is your desire, so is your will. As is your will, so is your deed. As is your deed, so is your destiny. And then they bring it all together and say, your deepest desire is your destiny. So... What I have found, I've, by the way, I found that quote to be true uh, for several decades for me personally, because I think that's just the way the world works. Uh, but I think it's it's true for uh, uh, many, many people, for most of us. So if we truly, truly want something and we are singularly focused on it uh, and we do everything in our powers to make it happen, uh, it's going to happen. So when I focused on 50 cent dollar bills and I kept going through stock after stock after stock, hunting for uh, those mispriced bargains, of course I'm going to find them. And if I were to set the parameter as I want a 40 cent dollar, I'm going to find those too. If I said I want 30 cent dollar bills, I'm going to find those too. So even if you were to set the parameters really tight where you say I'm only willing to pay 10 cents on the dollar for example as long as you were singularly singularly focused on it uh, it would happen I mean they were I think there were investments uh, that Lee Lu made when he was a student at Columbia you know so when Li Lu came as a poor Chinese uh, refugee to the US and he joined Columbia he didn't have any money. And, uh, you know, so he was on full scholarships, et cetera, and, uh, and student loans. And, and so he invested the float of those loans. So, you know, he might get ten or $15,000 a few weeks, a few months before he actually has to pay the money. And he would, you know, invest it. And uh, from that student uh, float that he had, by the time he finished at Columbia, I think five years later, or maybe four years later, uh, he had over a million dollars, and uh, so so he uh, and he never took a job. You know, he never worked uh, for anyone because uh, he was, uh, from his point of view, uh, you know, doing quite well. And uh, in that four-year period, I think if uh, if you were to talk to Li Lu, you know, there were some Russian company he found which was, you know, went up a hundred x. You know, so there were. Uh, they were unusual things. So whatever you set your baseline to be, if you set it to be $70, you'll find those. So 
I had set my baseline for more than 25 years at this 50 cent mark. And, you know, if I could get 40 or 30 cents, that was kind of, you know, icing on the cake. Uh, so I've changed that. I've, I've, I've said, okay, you know, that's so 20th century. And uh, so my, my hunt now is for 100 baggers. And so when you, when you shift the focus from a 50 cent dollar to saying, I want 100 baggers, you know, uh, kind of different things become relevant because what you're, uh, you know, when I was looking for 50 cent dollars, I didn't really care that much how much that pie grew. Uh, I mean, it, it, it could be that I was paying 60 cents for the current pie and that there would be some growth in the next two or three years and the pie might become 25% larger and I'd still get my double and life is great. Uh, but when you when you put on a lens which says that I want to uh, focus on 10 baggers or 100 baggers, um, the equation changes and what you look for changes. So for example, if I looked at a business like Amazon, uh, which is a wonderful, exceptional business, and of course, uh, Nick Sleep was very smart to have recognized Amazon very early and understood many things about its incredible moat before most of us did. And in fact, one of the reasons he shut down the fund was that uh, he had made a significant investment in Amazon. And, uh, you know, it might have been a fifth of the fund uh, in terms of invested capital. And, uh, and, and then, of course, it was going up in value and becoming a larger and larger portion of the fund. And the British regulators uh, questioned the, the risk management and the portfolio management, uh, two very alien concepts to Nick Sleep. And, uh, and I think uh, that was one factor, but his partner and he kind of looked at each other. They were managing about three billion. Uh, they had become wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. They did not want to sell Amazon. They did not want to take that concentration down. And uh, so what they said is we'll return all the capital. And they did. So in 2014, they wrote to the investors and said, uh, we are kind of um, hanging up our boots and uh, retiring. And they were in their, you know, kind of 40s at that time. And, uh, you know, here's your capital back. And Nick Sleep basically told his investors that I am going to take my proceeds and put it into three businesses. And the three businesses he uh, put his money into, all his money into, were, were Berkshire, Costco and Amazon. And in 2014, uh, Amazon was around $300 a share. And uh, so even if you ignore what happened to Berkshire and Costco, uh, you know, if Amazon was a third of the pie, uh, that would have been an incredible home run uh, while, you know, having the broker starve with no commissions. And, and he told his uh, investors when he returned the capital, that uh, you don't need to pay us any fees. Uh, you don't need to read our boring letters. Just buy these three stocks with the capital we're returning to you and warm regards. And of course, the institutional investors who they gave this money back to, um, you know, in fact, I got calls from some of them. Uh, I remember one endowment that called me and they were kind of freaked out. And they're telling me, oh, you know, do you know Nick Sleep is returning all the capital? I said, yeah, but uh, he told you what to do. He told you just take the money and buy the three stocks. And they said, well, our mandate doesn't allow us to buy individual stocks. So then I said to them, would you like me to set up a separate account for you where I'll buy those three stocks and then you can pay me ridiculous fees? So these, these are the kind of conversations that go on with our enlightened uh, endowments and uh, institutions. Uh, and needless to say, they did none of that, you know, and probably 
uh, grazing at their navel right now, wondering why they didn't do so well. Uh, so anyway, so uh, Nick's, Nick's point was that um, an investor, an investor in Walmart or an investor in Amazon or Costco or Berkshire should have the framework which the founders or the owners of the business have. So the Walton family basically is not interested in selling Walmart stock. And they just held it throughout. They held it even after Sam Walton went away and even after the next generation uh, has started going away. So it, it's been a multi-generation hold. And, uh, you know, the, the same thing applies to Berkshire Hathaway and, and to Amazon. Now, one of the things that happens that if you are exceptionally good at this, if you do really well at this and you're running a pool of temporary capital, like Nick Sleep was running, uh, what is going to happen is one stock is going to become 90% or 95% of the pie. And uh, most uh, institutional investors and money managers would choke at that. They would never allow that to happen. And I think that's ridiculous. Uh, so what, what I think should happen is that once you're starting to get concentrated, don't let new investors come in. So kind of freeze the capital. And broadcast loud and clear to everyone that fasten your seatbelts. Uh, we're not selling these positions. Uh, we're going to be holding on. And if you don't feel comfortable, you can exit, uh, but uh, we're not going to cut the flowers and water the weeds. And um, so, uh, you know, going back to the Upanishads, you know, I shifted my thinking to uh, 100 baggers. And so obviously, you know, the, the Amazons and Apples and Googles of the world, if you do 100x from their current multiples, uh, I think it would require quite a stretch of the imagination to get to a point where you thought it was high probability that even in 20 years, you would get 100x from year. So, so certain things, so Amazon probably is a great investment, but at least for me, it's not 100 bagger material. I mean, it was 100 bagger material. I was too dumb to take advantage but I don't think it's happening from here in the next two decades. And uh, so once you once you shift that framework, um, you know, different things come into focus. And uh, so, for example, in, uh, in 2019, which is before my period of enlightenment, uh, I had I'd been visiting Turkey several times and um, I encountered this business in Turkey where the market cap was 19 million. And the liquidation value was somewhere between 300 million and a billion, somewhere in that range. And uh, of course, you know, I tried to buy every share I could. Uh, and we ended up investing $7 million and getting a one third stake in the business. And uh, so my framework at that time was that this is a good business. Uh, it's it's the number one warehouse operator, lots of recurring revenue, uh, number one operator of private freight uh, cars in Turkey and uh, and a few other uh, very nice businesses. Uh, very good recurring revenue businesses, very good operators. And uh, they, they created tremendous value over the years. So I said, you know, we'll hang on and we'll see kind of at what point there's a convergence between uh, you know, our equity position and intrinsic value. And when we get to intrinsic value, we can unload and move on. Well, that framework has changed now. So it's been close to two years that we've held the stock. And uh, now my thinking is that, yeah, so it's worth 300 million to a billion when we bought it. Um, could it. Could it be worth 2 billion at some point? Uh, because if it's if it gets to a two billion value, uh, when we were buying it, it was a twenty million or nineteen million market cap. That's a hundred bagger, and uh, 
a 300 or 500 million or a billion dollar business today, getting to 2 billion isn't that hard. And it isn't that hard in 10 or 20 years. So my take now with that business is set it and forget it, you know. And the way we think about that business, the way I think about the old, that portfolio position is it's not a portfolio position. It is a business we are a partial owner of. Uh, we are a passive owner. Uh, we are a junior partner to the family that runs it. Uh, we have no desire to tell them what to do or how to do things. They are doing quite well without any input from us. And uh, life is great. So we just kind of watch from the sidelines. So the simple, the simple uh, math here is there are just two things that matter. The first thing is a periodic check on is the business getting better? And of course, you know, business doesn't go up in a straight line. So you have to take out the noise. But in general, if you're seeing that the moat is intact and the moat is widening and deepening, then forget about the valuation. Then the second part, which is the valuation, is like I just said, forget about the valuation. If it gets egregious, not overvalued, but egregiously overvalued, then you can take a look at it. So, for example, if I think this Turkish business is worth two billion at some point, and the market is pricing it at twenty billion, for example, we would probably not be a shareholder at that point, or even much before that point. But it would have to get to significant egregious overvaluation uh, to doing that. And so the third part of this journey is that uh, if I can find these 100 baggers, uh, or at least companies that uh, look like decent candidates that over a 10 or 20 year period, they could get there then we become a, a portfolio becomes a museum and we become a collector of these hundred baggers. Uh, it's great from a tax point of view because we just sit on them. And, uh, and the idea is that we only really need one. I mean, the Turkish business might not do it for us because it was such a small investment. You know, we put like a little over 1% of the portfolio into that. But if I could make a $50 million bet, and at some point, it became a 20, 50, 100 bagger. You know, it would become a very significant portion of the portfolio. And we don't really need the rest of the portfolio to do that much. So the rest of the portfolio is still not slouches. So Berkshire has underperformed the S&P for Nick, but it's still gone up in value. Costco probably has matched it over this period. But it doesn't matter. It's It's fine. Those two have added value. And then you have one with kind of high octane returns. And so that has worked out really well. So these uh, these are some of my uh, blessed COVID learnings. So uh, in many ways, I think maybe I should be grateful uh, for COVID because it uh, put an end to my travel, gave me more time to contemplate my navel and, uh, and uh, try to understand what's going on. And I told Nick that as soon as international travel opens up, I'd love to have dinner with him. And uh, he's excited about that. So that would be my first my first trip uh, leaving the U.S. will be to uh, break bread with Nick and Zach, and that'll be great. So thank you, uh, Professor George. I think it's uh, uh, delighted to be here. <laughs>